Thank you for having me. Um, this presentation, I'm uh, Kristen Hamagi, as uh, you just said, I represent the Shipwreck Centre and Maritime Museum on Lower White in the UK. Um, this presentation is um, <coughs> going to start with a question. And is this museum, so this I'm talking about the Shipwreck Centre and Maritime Museum, for us as academics or the public? So these 15 minutes, I will um, really try to focus on what we get lost if we focus only on the history of the items themselves, but forget what, why they're in there and who collected them. And, then we, and we've had some really, really nice presentations this afternoon and, and morning of um, collections that have been put, put together by individuals. Um, but what I think, and I haven't had all of the presentations in this session, um, but most of them um, focus on the, on the individuals that collected these in the um, 18th century, like the British Museum, Pitt Rivers Museum, 1884, um, and other museums, maybe towards the early 20th century. Um, but this presentation will actually focus on history just happening at the moment. So, um, just bring us to where we are in the world. Um, the south coast of the UK, you have this island, Isle of Wight. Um, and the Shipwreck Centre and Maritime Museum was um, initially started in Bembridge in 1978, so 40 years ago this year. And in 2006, it moved to Ayrton, which is just in the middle of the island. It moved from a, a coastal position. And um, obviously, you can hear on the, on the name of the museum, it's, it is a maritime museum. Um, but we moved into this um, art village as, as such. There's an old village with a church, a duck pond, which is just here, and other arts and, and crafts um, attractions, um, pub as well, um, sweet shop. And we're hosting this old barn that's been converted to be a museum, perfectly converted for the museum when it moved in 2006. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, the museum was started 40 years ago by Martin Woodhead. Um, he's still alive, he just turned 40, uh, 40 70 um, about two days ago. He just got married. He's, he's very much of a character. Um, and he grew up on the island. He wasn't born there. He grew up there, which apparently I've understood is quite a big difference for, the, for him and the island. And um, he always looked out to the sea and, and thought, what is there? What, what, where can I find um, adventure. And back then, he didn't need a diving qualification. He just bought some equipment and started diving. And the south coast of England and the waters around Isle of Wight, the Solent, are filled with shipwrecks. Shipwrecks from almost any time period and up to, to modern shipwrecks, but World War I and World War II are highly presented there as well. So he started um, diving and looking and bringing up as much as he could possibly do. And um, the thing is, is this an archaeological collection? And no, it's, it's not. I am an archaeologist, but this is not an archaeological collection as such, because we have no record of, of uh, where the objects and artefacts have really been recovered more than we know the wreck. And as I will mention later as well, within the database, we do record, try to record that data. Um, but he, he spent most of his time, later he trained as a um, commercial diver. He worked in the North Sea, among other places. And, and made it really his career. He's still out there um, collecting items, but by the time he was 29, he decided that his living room was a little bit too, uh, too small to fit this private collection that was growing quite fast. And he decided to um, buy a cottage and turn it into a museum, as you do. Um, as a part of this, I also need to mention that uh, what Martin does and has done for the last uh, 50 years, is legal in the UK. Um, it's not encouraged by, by me personally or the archaeological uh, community, so, but it is legal. And as long as you uh, report everything to the receiver of REC, um, you are actually not breaking the law. Um, so if you don't receive it to the, if you don't report your fines to the receiver, you can be in trouble. And this is an article from 2014 in the um, newspaper, The Guardian where divers have been prosecuted and had to buy, um, pay hefty fines for not reporting these funds. Because there are protected wrecks, um, and there are wrecks that aren't protected where you can lift items from. So Martin is not diving on any protected wrecks. He's diving on other, but reporting everything and doing it according to, to UK law. 
So anyway, 40 years ago, he bought this uh, modest cottage in Burbridge, and he spent the next um, couple of years, the first 10 years, really, to convert it into a museum. So this is what it looked like when he first bought it. And this is um, 84, I believe, 82, 84, when he's put in a more of an open window here. So that's the window there to show what it looks like. This is also him wearing a ship's bell as a hat. Um, but, I mean, he's done an amazing job with um, not only collecting all of these artifacts, he's also um, looked after them. He's um, made sure they're all very stable. He used very simple but uh, very effective ways of stabilizing and conserving these finds. And we had a um, um, curator and conservator around to the museum, and, and when he left, he was almost in tears because he... He felt like his whole life had gone to, to learn about conservation and, and do conservation and, and treat and, and tell other people about conservation. And then you have this, this Martin guy who just used a bit of oil, a bit of uh, brass polish, and he's got a whole museum full of things that have never actually been conserved according to archaeological conservation uh, techniques. So he was a little bit um, upset in the end of that. But, um, Martin felt that, uh, we, um, that he had put as much as he possibly could into the museum and it moved to, to Ayrton because Benbridge was getting a bit small, there wasn't any parking and, and he felt that the people coming there couldn't really um, enjoy the collection as it was intended. So in, uh, last year, 2017, he um, approached the Maritime Archaeology Trust, which is a local um, archaeological organisation um, in Southampton and asked if we could in, in a way take over the management and, and turn this museum into something new and save towards a bright future. So since uh, last spring, so 2017 spring, uh, the Maritime Archaeology Trust has been uh, managing the museum. And I do keep on using the word museum. Martin was always uh, quite careful with the word museum. He always said it's called the Shipwreck Centre, and this is, this is the logo that he's um, one of his mates developed. So you see that the Shipwreck Centre, the Maritime Museum. And that's really, I think, his attitude, and he's done an amazing job with it, but he never really wanted to be a museum as such. But here I come with all my uh, newfangled ideas and, and changes. He's not, um, I think, that keen on changes. But now we have this collection. And I will show um, examples from the collection in later slides. But we also have, we got trustees, because we are a Maritime Archaeology Trust, trustee. we got the curator, it's me in this case, we got formal procedures, we got displays and databases, we're working towards museum accreditation, if you're familiar with the, with the UK system, it's a two-stage system where uh, you first apply to be working towards accreditation, and that was approved uh, earlier this year. So now we have a year to put in a, put in a full application. And then amongst all of that, we also visit to staff and volunteers. So, so suddenly from being almost like a collector's paradise where you put everything that you like, you're actually a part of a, a larger system. And the museum itself is, is almost like a player in this field. It's, it's a new character that we need to um, look after and, and sometimes make very harsh decisions on the collections. So here we have, if a museum is only as good as uh, its collection, we have an amazing museum. Um, these are only a few, few examples of um, how things are displayed. And it's not a very modern way of doing it, I would say. But people love it. And <laughs> ideally, I would like to go in and I would move a lot of it out into um, storage and magazines. We don't have any storage for magazines. So, we also have a very small budget. The museum just about makes even. So, um, but we have, I did my own uh, master's dissertation about navigation dividers. And here they are with hardly any labels next to some um, gold uh, coin replicas. <laughs> we have some pocket watches. Uh, these are also coins that haven't been um, extracted from the concretion. Um, here's a couple of shipwrecks in the same display case. And this um, area, which is under one of the stairs, um, illustrates how a shipwreck site looks to the diver who finds it, which being a diver, I can't really uh, identify with, but, but it's a lot of finds in a small area. And um, 
people do like it, Martin likes it, and I can see the attraction of walking around and really having time to look at all of these items. But in terms of modernizing it, it, um, it needs something, I think, without um, taking away what, what Martin did. So um, it's helpful of where um, my decisions were prob uh, was not the right one, and I didn't go ahead with it, is that we have a um, video room. So the museum uh, is made up of the main gallery here, and then we have another gallery that shares space for the museum shop. And we have um, a DVD gallery, you might call it. And when I first heard of it, I thought of DVD. Who watches DVDs anyway? Um, but it takes up quite a lot of space in terms of what space would you have. And ideally, I thought, in, initially, I thought, let's take this out, let's take the DVD out, and use this space to make a nice gallery where you can walk to. We'll have nice display cases where we put one item with a um, proper way of describing it. But this DVD, and this is, um, this is I can see, I spent Martin up a little bit. Um, it's 45 minutes long when it's in the museum. This is a one minute summary of it. And it was also key for me to stop talking when the video finished, but I'll turn it on again. Just so, um, this is a one minute summary. And it shows the museum, Martin tells stories about it, um, how he found, found artifacts. And people, people just love it. They sit there for 45 minutes, and then they spend another um, hour or so in the museum. And people buy the DVD. It's one of our best sellers. It just goes, and that shows where, <laughs> where maybe my decisions always aren't the best. So here, um, another example is uh, what do we do with how do we modernize it? And we, but without losing all the work that Martin's done, but also without losing Martin in this collection, because I think it's a strong selling point. It is a, something that people would want to come and see the story of him. Um, I was standing next to his wife one day, and, and one of the um, people visiting went past and said, oh, I wouldn't be, want to be married to him. And then, <laughs> I can literally know that she would. But here's a bridge telegraph recovered from the wreck of SS Mandy, lost in 1917. Item was recovered and stored by Martin Woodward in 1987. Let's say that's a typical uh, museum sign of this very, very important shipwreck, which you might have heard of because it was in the news recently, where the bell from the shipwreck was actually presented by Theresa May to uh, the South African uh, government and uh, president. But Martin was the first one to find the wreck. He often describes the wreck as his favorite wreck amongst shipwrecks that he's dived. No one knew where he was. And his amazing history, especially for South Africa, because uh, more than 600 people were lost on the wreck. Um, so it has an important history um, from a historical point of view. It's important for Martin, because he did find it. He spent years going out there on the uh, Remembrance Day and, and other, uh, on the day of sinking and putting up reefs. And he's been involved. It's, it's important for him. So how do we then capture that story together with the telegraph as an example? And of course, we can use 3D techniques. We can use screens. We can put up posters. And it would be really easy if we only had the telegraph. But then we have the next display case with the same amount of material. And even more. So I'm just finishing off again by um, asking what will get lost to focus only on the history of the items. So only the objects, only the, the telegraph itself. But we forget why they're in there. We forget the important work that, that Martin has done for the last 40 years or 50 years. And then in another 50 years, we'll end up not knowing very much about it all and, and all of it will get us. We have started databasing it and we have um, seven, more than 700 records where Martin goes in and fills in the details that aren't obvious in the museum. So we're trying to capture this information and hopefully move towards a accredited museum where both the visitor um, students can come in and, and do research on these unique artifacts and objects um, and um, where parts of the museum work. So I think I'll finish there. <laughs>